This morning we're continuing with our study in the book of James and we come to one of the most harsh passages in the entire New Testament. There are some passages that are fun to preach about. There are others that are not so much fun, but we need to hear the full counsel of the Word of God. Now at first when we read these verses, you may think, oh, that applies to other people. It doesn't have any application to our lives. In fact, I think it does have some application to our lives. And so I hope that you will hear these words prayerfully. James, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 6, I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have, con you have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Now, many people believe that the Bible teaches that it's wrong to be wealthy. They think that the Bible says money is the root of all evil, but most of you know that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, God is not opposed to wealth. In fact, many of the most well-known and respected people in the Bible were extremely wealthy people. Abraham was a very wealthy man. The Bible says that Job was the wealthiest man of his time. We know that David and Solomon had immense wealth. We know that Barnabas in the New Testament made a lot of money because he was able to give a lot to the church. Joseph of Arimathea, the man who gave Jesus his tomb, was a very wealthy man. So God is not opposed to wealth or wealthy people just because they're wealthy. But God is very much opposed to the misuse and abuse of wealth. He wants us to use our wealth wisely no matter how much or how little we have. Now it helps to understand this passage in James if you know in New Testament times there was basically no such thing as a middle class. The people in the New Testament were either rich or poor. And yes, there were gradations of you were poor, poor, or poorest, but there basically was no middle class. You were either a have or a have not. And unfortunately, it was usually the case that the rich manipulated and oppressed the poor who were continually abused and taken advantage of by everyone. Now in our passage today, James lashes out at the oppressive use of wealth and strongly rebukes those who use their wealth to put the poor down and to mistreat them. This passage is one of the strongest condemnations of anyone in the entire New Testament. James uses every devastating word that he can think of to condemn the wealthy oppressors. He, he, he accuses them or he, he cites four specific abuses. Now while we may not can commit these exact sins or be as directly abusive about the way we use our wealth, this passage is a strong warning to all of us that God is very concerned about how we use our wealth and how we treat other people, especially people who are less fortunate than we are. So this morning we're going to look at the wrong and the right uses of wealth. Now I think it's also important to realize as we study this passage that in the context of the world that we live in, every single one of us is wealthy. If you own a car, you are wealthy. If you have more than two changes of clothes, you are wealthy. 
If you own a home you didn't build yourself out of mud bricks and cardboard or rusted pieces of tin or plastic tarps or sticks and thatch, you're in the top 5% of people in the world. I've told you a number of times before that out of the 7 billion people that live now on this planet, that, the majority, that, that more than half of those live on the equivalent of $2 a day or less. We are all wealthy compared to most people in the world. So we need to listen carefully to James' words. Remember, it's not wrong to be wealthy. James says it's wrong to hoard your wealth. It's wrong to ignore the needs of others. And it's wrong to use what you have to put others down, to abuse them. Now, the reason that, that socialism and communism gets traction around the world is because of the abuses of unbridled capitalism. The Bible talks about, you know, is basically built on a, a system where people are allowed to earn money and become wealthy by hard work, but it's always regulated by the laws of God. We unfortunately live in a world where, where people can point and they can say, okay, so that we can have cheaper designer clothes in our department store, children in Bangladesh are forced to work 10 hours a day for pennies. And that's true. Or in China, you know, my, some, many of the things that we get that are inexpensive, it's basically done by slave labor, by people who have no choice to be, but, but to be there. But the problem in our society now, of course, there are those who are more than willing to point out all the evils of capitalism. And the Bible points out, you know, unbridled capitalism that's not regulated by the laws of God. That, that can be bad. But the thing that many don't point out in this time when uh, so many are saying on the news that we're, we're trained Marxists, they're saying, some of the people of the, some of the organizations. And, uh, you know, every place in the world that Marxism has become the philosophy of the society, Christians have been persecuted and imprisoned and ultimately killed. And not just Christians, but indeed millions and millions of other people. So yes, there are abuses of wealth, abuses of capitalism. But when, you, but when we talk about those, we always have to balance that off, that that is the system that God presents that people should be able to own property, they should be able to work hard, they should be able to obtain wealth, and God doesn't, uh, God doesn't condemn wealth that's correctly earned and correctly spent. But what are the four common abuses of wealth that James calls out in this passage of Scripture? We're going to look first at the wrong uses of wealth and how to avoid them, and then we're going to look at the right uses of wealth. Now, the first abuse of wealth that James talks about is excessive accumulation of wealth. James says in verse 3, you have heaped up treasure in the last days. Or some English translations say, you have hoarded wealth in the last days. Now, according to the New Testament, the last days began after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. We are living in the last days now, 2,000 years closer to the time of Christ's return than the people who originally read James' words. We live in a crucial time in world history when we're racing toward the end of time as we know it. God says all throughout the Bible that money is not just to be stockpiled and collected uh, just for the sake of having it. But even more so in the crucial period between Christ's first coming and His second coming when literally billions of people's eternity hangs in the balance and God has given Christian people some of the greatest wealth in the history of the world. Now James is not condemning this passage of having some savings. The Bible encourages us to save as we're going to see in a little bit. It encourages us to save, to invest, so that we have money for a rainy day to meet our needs, the needs of our family, even the needs of others God leads us to help. God encourages savings, but again and again we're told not to hoard what God has given us. You know, once in a while you'll read in the newspaper about an elderly person who dies. They're living in obvious poverty in a rundown house and, uh, you know, they don't have adequate clothes, not adequate heating and cooling, but then after they die, someone looks under the mattress or in the mattress or pli pries up a floorboard and there's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now this isn't somebody who saved their money, they hoarded it. Why? 
Well, in those cases, it's usually a matter of mental illness because they were irrationally afraid of losing everything or they were afraid that they wouldn't have enough. Or sometimes, though, it's not a mental illness at all. Money just becomes an end, end in itself. For some people, accumulating money becomes the goal of their life. In the New Testament, there were three ways you could hoard wealth. You could stockpile food like grain and wine or olive oil, or you could collect expensive clothes made out of the finest materials, or you could gather precious metals like gold and silver and gather precious jewels. That's how the wealthy of Jesus' day hoarded wealth. It was also the way that they showed off their wealth by cons conspicuous consumption by having a lot of food and a lot of clothes and a lot of precious metals and jewels on display for everyone to see. While the poor were begging for a crust of bread, the wealthy man's table was breaking down with a feast on it every day. You see that in Jesus' parable. While most people had just one or two outfits and some only rags, the wealthy flaunted a different extravagant outfit every day. While the, few had, while the poor had a few clay dishes, the wealthy had elaborate dinnerware made out of solid gold. James speaks about all three of these types of wealth in verse 2 and 3. He says, your wealth is rotted. He's talking about grain that's molded, olive oil that's gone rancid, wine that's turned into vinegar. Moths have eaten your clothes and your gold and silver are corroded. He, everything you've hoarded is ultimately going to be wasted and destroyed. He says the food is spoiled, the moths have eaten your fine clothes, the gold and silver are corroding. The point he's making is whatever you accumulate just for the purpose of accumulating ultimately is going to deteriorate and de decay. Which clothes get moth eaten? The ones that you wear every day or the ones you keep stockpiled in the back of your closet? It's the ones that we hoard that get moth-eaten. What foods goes rotten, the food you eat every day? No, it's the stuff in the back of the refrigerator or the pantry that's been there for weeks or months. James' point is wealth is to be used, not hoarded. Now last week we talked about the wealthy man in Jesus' Luke 12 parable who was very successful and had a great harvest. He said, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger barns. He didn't ever think about giving any of what he had gotten and been blessed with to the poor that were all around him in his day. No, he decided, I'm going to hoard it. I'm going to keep this all for myself. Jesus says, and James here says, that's the wrong use of wealth. So the first misuse of wealth is to hoard it. The second issue James talks about is the misappropriation of wealth. God is not only concerned with what we do with, uh, he's not only concerned with what we do with what we have, he's also very concerned with how we got it. Did we make our money by cheating others out of theirs? And there are many ways to do that. James gives a common example of how it was done in his day in verse 4. He writes, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. In New Testament times, most people were laborers and workers on a daily basis. You were hired at the beginning of the day, you worked all day, and at the end of the day, you were given your money. But James gives the example of a man who hires a laborer, but at the end of the day, he makes some false excuse, some bogus excuse about not liking the work he's done, and so he won't pay him. He pays him nothing, even though the man has worked all day for him. It's just stealing. It's fraud. Now, there are many ways to steal from others then and now. If I charge too much for a product, if I don't fulfill a contract, if I sell a used car to you and don't tell you it needs major repairs, if I don't scan everything at the self-checkout, if I play on the computer all day instead of doing the work I'm being paid to do. There are all kinds of ways to steal. James says, you know, God doesn't approve of stealing, especially from those who are poor. And yet we live in a world where many people make their money, you know, by schemes to steal from the most vulnerable in our society, whether it's senior adults, whether it's the poor. There are all kinds of scams. 
James says, you know, if you do those kinds of things, it's no different from the unscrupulous employer who steals the wages of his day laborers. So James condemns hoarding wealth and stealing to get wealthy. The third issue James talks about in this passage is how we spend our wealth, how we allocate it. The Bible makes it very clear that God is very concerned with what you do with what you've got. So James blasts the wealthy of his day in verse 5 because of how they've spent their money. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury, he writes. Or some English translation says, you have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You know, God's given us so many blessings and they're all for our enjoyment. But throughout the Bible, God frowns on people who aren't just satisfied with a nice house. They want a, a palace. They aren't just satisfied, you know, with, with having some, some jewelry. They want to have the most expensive jewelry or more than anyone else. The Bible says, yes, enjoy the money and the things God has given you, but don't just senselessly waste them on extravagant things in a world of homelessness and hunger. We're not to waste our wealth. One of the greatest temptations we have to avoid, especially in an affluent area like ours, is the temptation as we make more and more to selfishly want to spend it all on ourselves. You know, one of the things I've learned as a pastor over the years is the people who give the most money are ordinary people, not the people that are wealthy that you would think. Oh, they write a big check for a building program. Here's a $10,000 check. But a, a teacher who ties all of her life will give many, many thousands of dollars more than most millionaires ever give. The more money you make, the easier it is to waste it. Ever heard someone say, I can afford it, so why not? Bathing in champagne is not a very good way to get clean, but it's the best way to show other people how wealthy you are. And don't we just love in our society to see shows about the financial extravagance of the rich and famous. Just because I can afford something doesn't mean I ought to buy it. So James says, in accumulation of wealth, don't hoard it. In the appropriation of wealth, don't steal it. In the allocation of wealth, don't waste it. But there's one more that he addresses. The fourth issue that James addresses in our passage this morning is the application of our wealth. James says, don't abuse the power and the influence that wealth gives you. You see, wealth gives us more than just simple buying power. It does far more for us than simply enable us to get more things or nicer things. Richard Foster in his book, Money, Sex, and Power, reminds us money gives a person influence and authority. We listen to people who have money more than we listen to people who are poor. Why do the rich get away with things that we can't get away with? It's not always because they buy their way out of trouble. A lot of times no money changes hands. The rich just have more influence and they've got more influential friends. You can use the influence that money brings for good or evil. And James sees that in his society, in his day, many of those who are wealthy are using their affluence to pervert justice. In verse 6, he writes, you have, you have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Most modern translations have made the meaning of the Greek clearer here when they translate the last phrase, they are powerless to stop you. James sees the wealthy are misusing their wealth and power to pervert justice and destroy the lives of the poor if they get in their way, and there's nothing that the poor can do about it. Even today, money is used to manipulate justice. The rich not only resort to bribes, they give big campaign contributions to get their way, they also have powerful attorneys that many times overwhelm a person who may be in the right, but they can't afford the lawyers to prove it. On a much smaller scale, I've known families that control their adult children by threatening to cut them out of the will, or in employers who demand that their employees do work for them personally on the side that they don't pay them for, and if they won't do it, then they'll lose their job at the company where they do get paid. That's an abusive use of wealth and the influence it brings. Many of you know there used to be company towns in the United States where the company would pay part of the person's wages with script. Miners, loggers, mill workers lived in these company towns and the only place you could spend company script was at the company store. And when you ran out of money or script, the company store would still keep you, they would still sell you food and your clothes and whatever other necessity you need and you would put it on credit. 
But many workers got so far in debt to the company store, they couldn't quit even if they wanted to. I don't know whether you all know it or not. Some of you probably know Tennessee Ernie Ford's old song, I load 16 tons, what do I get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. The consequences of, you know, that, that's using money to control and manipulate other people. Now, the consequences of misused wealth are scattered throughout verses 1 through 5. Listen again as James reminds his readers in the strongest possible way that first, hoarded wealth is going to decay and become useless, valueless. And secondly, that dishonestly acquired wealth, wasted wealth, abused wealth is going to be judged harshly by God. James has some pretty strong words on the abuse of wealth. Come now, you rich... Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are martha eaten, your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days, and need the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud. Cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. That's the Lord of hosts, of the millions and millions of angels. You have lived on the earth, he writes in verse 5, in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. James is saying the God of the universe who created it all and who, who commands untold millions of legions of angels is going to slaughter you for all you've done to oppress the poor and heartlessly ignore the needs of of those who are less fortunate. Now James intends for these words to get people's attention and to motivate change. So the obvious question is how are we to handle our wealth in a way that's pleasing to God? So let's go back over the four issues James has raised. The accumulation of wealth, the appropriation of wealth, the allocation of wealth, the application of wealth, and see what God has to say about how to do it the right way. Well, first, right accumulation. Proverbs 21, 20 says, The wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. The Bible tells us we are to accumulate wealth. God doesn't want you living a hand-to-mouth existence. Proverbs 30, 24 says, Consider the ant, how it stores up food for the winter. The Bible says we ought to save. The average American saves about 4% of their income. The average European saves 16% of their income. The average Japanese person saves 25% of their income. Now, they've said that during this COVID crisis and the feeling of vulnerability that Americans have almost doubled their savings to a whopping 8%. That's still half of what the Europeans save and only a third of what the Japanese save. Why is it that we save so little. Well, for one thing in our society, we have the illusion that we won't be touched. They've been through two world wars that, that came right to their doorstep. But I think another part of that is we're a consumer society. We've been trained to live for today. The average person today thinks, I want it now, whether I can afford it or not, and I'll just put it on my credit card. God says the wise person saves and invests his money. Jesus told a lot of parables, as you know. What you may not realize is over half of those parables deal with money and material things. Jesus talked more about money and material things than he did about heaven or hell. Why? Why did Jesus talk so much about money? As far as we know, he never took an offering. Well, because we have such a hard time managing it correctly. Jesus talks about investment in the parable of the talents, how two wise servants invested the master's money and doubled it, but one unwise man didn't invest the money, he just buried it. And the master comes back and says, you wicked and lazy servant, it's wicked to do nothing with the money, the time, the talent, the resources God has entrusted to us. When we save and invest our money, we get our money to work for us rather than us working for our money. Now, in order to develop the habit of saving, you've got to do two things. First, you've got to learn to live on less than you make. John D. Rockefeller was famous for saying, save 10%, tithe 10%, live on 80%. He was, you know, a standard or founder of Standard Oil, such a wealthy man. People were always asking him, how do you get wealthy? 
That's what he'd tell them. Save 10%, tithe 10%, live on 80%. It worked for him and it'll work for anyone who does it because it's consistent with the way the Bible says we're to manage our money. The second thing you have to do if you're going to develop the habit of savings, you've got to learn contentment. If you don't learn contentment with what you have, you'll spend all the money you make as soon as you get it. Some of you may know the saver's motto, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. One of the biggest enemies of contentment in our society is advertising. We have this multi-billion dollar advertising and marketing industry in this country that works 24 hours a day to make you see their product and think, how can I live without that another minute? I've got to have it now. What's the purpose of saving? Here's, what the Bible, here's where the Bible differs from the world's thinking in a what major way. The world thinks that you save money so that you will be secure. If I just accumulate a big enough bank account, then I'll not only be financially secure, but I can take care of all the other problems that are going to come up in life. <clears throat> the problem is there's no such thing as absolute security. No matter how much money you've got, you can lose it instantly. History is filled with examples of that fact right up into today. Do you know why the wealthy Jews didn't leave Germany after, long after it was clear that Hitler was determined to destroy them? Well, because I own department stores. Surely my wealth will protect me. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer, you know. Surely my wealth will protect me. But it, but it didn't. Circumstances can take away everything I have, my family, my money, my reputation, everything. There's only one thing that can't be taken away from me, and that's my relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says I've got to put my security in Jesus Christ and not in a savings account. Not in stocks, not in bonds. You, it's okay to have those things, but don't put your faith in those things. Christians don't save like the world saves so that they'll be secure. Paul says in Philippians 4.19, My God shall supply all your needs out of His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. That's real security. That's the way to be prepared for whatever may happen in the future. Then why should Christians save? Well, the, as I told you, the Bible tells us to save. But... Ultimately, we're to save so that we can not only provide for our needs, but so that we can generously give, just as God generously gives. But we're getting ahead of our outline in our text. So first, we're told to accumulate savings, but don't hoard the wealth simply for the sake of having it, but use it for the plans and purposes of God. That's the right reason to accumulate wealth. What's the right way to get wealth? The right way to appropriate wealth. Well, the Bible says the way that God would have us get wealth is to work for it. Proverbs 13, 11, wealth from gambling quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows. What's gambling? It's not just going to the to casino, you know, and playing blackjack or going to the track and betting on horses or going to 7-Eleven and buying, you know, uh, uh, some, uh, some kind of scratch card. You know, what is gambling? It's any get-rich-quick scheme. In the book of Proverbs, at least six or seven times, Scripture teaches us don't get involved in get-rich-quick schemes. Don't base, you know, your sense of earning. If you want to play a game like that, that's fine, but realize it's a game, and most of them are stacked against you. The Bible says if you make it quickly, you'll lose it just as quickly, and a quick study of lottery winners proves that's true. Proverbs 14.23 says, Hard work brings a profit, mere talk leads to poverty. Over and over again, the Bible talks about the value of work, that God approves of work as a means of making wealth. Proverbs 12.27, and the good news is translated, If you're lazy, you'll never get what you're after, but if you work hard, you can get a fortune. What matters to God is not so much how much money you make, but how you make it. Make your money with honest work. What does the Bible say about right allocation, the right way to spend the money that I've worked hard to make? Well, the Bible says we should spend our money carefully and wisely. Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as sure as haste leads to poverty. He's talking about planning how you make your money, how you use the money you've made. The Bible says to plan our spending. The best way to do that, the best way to have a plan for your spending is to have a budget, even if it's not written down on paper, something that you've got in your head. 
You know, the median income of Loudoun County is a, hundred, is a little over $125,000 a year. That's the highest median income per household of any county in the United States. But having pastored in this county for a quarter of a century, one of the things that I know that is true is a lot of those families who are making that much or a great deal more than that are still under tremendous financial stress. The problem is not how much they're making, it's how much they spend. They're not spending wisely, so they're under a lot of stress. How do you spell relief? B-U-D-G-E-T. Spending money wisely means having a budget. What is a budget? It's planned spending. Telling your money where you want it to go instead of trying to figure out where did it all go. The wise man plans. The plans of the diligent, Proverbs says, leads to profit as sure as haste leads to poverty. The opposite of budgeted spending is impulse buying. So God wants us to make money honestly, save it faithfully, spend it wisely. Why? And then that's the application part, so that we can give generously. Proverbs 11, 24, and 25 it says, it is possible to give away and become richer. It is also possible to hold on too tightly and lose everything. Yes, the generous man shall be rich. By watering others, he waters himself. Now, this principle is taught over and over again in Scripture. As a matter of fact, it's Jesus that says, Give, and it will be given unto you. Just like seeds, the more we sow, the Bible says, the more we're going to reap. There are more promises in the Bible related to giving than any other subject. Why? Because God wants us to learn to be givers because God's a giver. If you want to become like Jesus Christ, you've got to learn to give because Jesus Christ was willing to give everything, even His own life. No matter how wealthy I become, I'll never be financially free until I learn to give. In order to live abundantly, I've got to be willing to give abundantly. The root of the word miserable is miser. When I'm a miser, when I hold on to it, when I hoard what I have, I'm miserable. But if I learn to give, the Bible says I'll be a happy person. I'll have a deep sense of peace. I'll have a deep sense of joy. You've heard many people say you can't take it with you. That's true, but the Bible says you can send it ahead. It was Jesus himself on the Sermon on the Mount who said, Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Jesus went on to say in Matthew 6, 20, Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. I think I may have told you before about the guy who died. He went to heaven. He saw all the beautiful mansions. They went past all those. He was taken to a little shack. He said, is this where I'm supposed to spend eternity? Why? The angel answered, well, that's all the building material you sent ahead. <laughs> How do you send it ahead? How do you store up treasure in heaven? The only way you store up treasure in heaven is by investing it in people who are going there. As I always point out, the Bible says there are only two things on this earth that are going to last. The Word of God and people. Everything else is going to burn up at the final judgment. Invest your time and money in the Word of God and in people. That's the only investment that pays interest for all of eternity. How do you invest in people? In Luke 16, Jesus told a parable that shocks a lot of people because He uses a crook as an example. In Luke 16, 1 we read, Jesus told the disciples... There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called the man in and said, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you can no longer be my manager. The manager said to himself, What am I going to do now? My master is taking away my job. His master fired him because of his dishonesty. He didn't just take away his job. I am not strong enough to give and I'm ashamed. I'm too ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job, people will welcome me into their homes. So he called in each one of his master's debtors and asked the first one, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, quick, take your bill and make it 400. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. Take your bill and make it 800. You see, the manager is being dishonest again, simply to make friends with his master's debtors. And then the, the parable takes a surprising turn. Jesus says the master commended his dishonest manager.
because he had acted shrewdly. Now notice he wasn't commending him because he was dishonest, but for his shrewdness. Then Jesus says, For the people of this world are shrewder in their dealings with their own kind than the people of light. You see, people in this world realize the influence money has. But they also use it for wrong reasons and wrong ways, but it's consistent with their worldview. If you believe this world is all that there is, you only live for 70, 80, 90 years, you know, grab for all the gusto you can. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter how I live, how I cheat you, what I do, I just whatever I've got to do to get it for me. But if, if, if you believe that there is a God and there is an afterlife and that we just live here for 70 or 80 years and then there are the uncountable trillions and trillions and trillions of years of eternity, does what we do with our money here make any sense? Jesus says, no. Jesus, then Jesus goes on to say, So I say to you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Jesus is saying that when you use your money and invest it in people who come to know Christ, you're making friends for eternity. So when you get to heaven, they'll, they'll, they'll say, Oh, I'm here because of you. And you may not even know it. You see, practically what this is saying is, you know, every time you give an offering in the church that is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, or every time, you know, you give to a missionary offering, or every time you support a Christian organization that's feeding hungry children, or spreading Bibles, or doing, in some way, investing in the Word of God and investing in people, that's going to pay dividends for all of eternity, so Paul writes to Christians in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 16 too, and he's talking about a special offering. On every Sunday, put aside something from what you've earned during the week and use it for the offering. The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you to earn. The bottom line is, in all of this is mismanaged finances simply as a matter of misplaced priorities. We're putting physical things before spiritual things, and that's always a mistake that we're going to regret for all of eternity if we don't correct it. God wants us to be financially free. He wants to show us how to manage our money in a way that it blesses us now, and it blesses others now, but it doesn't just bless us now and bless others now. It also blesses us all throughout eternity. How do you do that? Well, the starting point for financial freedom and spiritual growth is to really make Jesus Christ the manager of your life. You start to live abundantly by letting Jesus Christ come into your life and manage not only how you use your money, but how you use your time and your relationships and your whole life. And then you start to tithe. I never apologize for teaching the tithe. Because I think it's an eternal biblical principle. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me. It's the only place in the Bible God says, Prove me. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Everyone I know who has tithed would say that is true. Elaine and I tithe, and we believe it's true. I want to encourage you to tithe. Not because this church needs the money. A lot of people look and say, oh, well, this church doesn't need that much money. And that, if I were to tithe, that would, that would be a lot of money. Well, if you don't feel like the your church needs it, then give it to you know, a Christian mission organization. Give it to the Gideons to buy Bibles. Give it to missionaries to spread the good news. You know, but give it to God. Give it to God. And you know, people say, oh, this is no Testament law. No, Abraham gave the tithe to Melchizedek before you know, there ever was a law. How can you say you're really committed to Jesus Christ if you don't do what God asked the poorest of the Jews to do? You know, I, I, I only tell you this and emphasize this because again and again the Scripture talks about the fact that as Christians we're to invest for eternity. It's the only investment that pays eternal dividends. If I knew a sure thing this morning and I said you can double your money I guarantee it, if you just do this with it. And you believe me, you know, and you put your money into that and it doubled. Well, what I'm telling you, and I will guarantee it based on the Word of God and the promises of God. Not only will you have more by giving the tithe to God. I don't mean you put a dollar in the plate and God gives you two dollars. God's got many ways that He blesses. 
But I, I've never known anyone that could outgive God. I'll never forget my mother, uh, my grandmother taught, and I'll, I'll quit here because I know I'm over time. Well, almost anyway. My grandmother taught with Gloria Roach. They taught, my grandmother taught second grade. She lived to be 99 years and eight months old, but she taught second grade for like how many years? 35 years in the public schools. But then she'd go on Sunday and she'd teach first graders in Sunday school. And her co-teacher, and that she did that for the same number of years at the First Baptist Church of South Miami, Florida. And Gloria Roach was her co-teacher. Now, Gloria Roach's husband, Fred Roach, had started out building little concrete block houses after the Second World War in Miami. And he asked my father who was an accountant when he graduated from the University of Miami at Coral Gables, if he would be his comptroller, his financial officer. And my father said, no, there's no, there's no money in building those little concrete block houses. Well, Fred Roach went on to be a multimillionaire. He now runs Centennial Homes out of Dallas, Texas. And Fred Roach, though, he used to, and I would be there, I would visit my grandmother quite a bit. Sometimes I'd spend the summer down in Miami. And Fred Roach, would, he was always the stewardship chairman because he would stand up and say, you know, at first he stood up and he said, you know, I've decided to tithe. Then the next year he said, well, that's worked out so well, now I'm going to give 15%. And the next year, 20 and 25 and 30 and 35 and 40 and 50. And finally, by the time Fred... <laughs> By the time Fred sold his business and moved to run Centennial Homes, he gave 100% of his salary to the Lord every year because he could just live on the stock dividends and benefits that he had invested over all of those years. Now, I know you, know, you can find some extraneous story, but you start reading and you start looking. Even John D. Rockefeller, the rascal that he was, he believed in the tithe and paid the tithe, the founder of Standard Oil. And you look at the people like J.C. Penney and people like that who built some of these great empires, and what you'll find is they tithed. So what I'm telling you is, you know, I'm just saying to you, I don't want you as your pastor to arrive in heaven and find out that you just have a little shack to live down at the end. <laughs> I want you to send it ahead. Invest for eternity. There are so many. We don't see them because they don't live right at our feet. You know, I wish sometimes I could take uh, you all with me the way I take Elaine to India and to Africa and some of these people and see these people sitting in the gutter, you know, and people who have absolutely nothing. And we live in this bubble of prosperity and we forget that we live in a world. So can just consider, consider. We don't have to feel guilty. God has blessed us. We don't have to feel guilty for that. But I do think we have to think, how do I responsibly use what God has given me to share with others, to make a difference in the world that we live in. Would you join me as we go to the Lord in our closing word of prayer? Heavenly Father, I pray that as we've looked into your word today, you'll take it and apply it to our lives in areas that each of us need to improve. Help us to use our material wealth as a testimony to the world that you are first in our lives. Help us to be generous with others as you've been generous with us. Help us to better support your work around the world while we have the financial means to do so. Help us to realize the crucial times in which we live. We pray that you would give us wisdom in making money, saving appropriately, spending wisely, and giving generously. We pray that we would, that we would allow you to become the manager of our lives, truly our King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.